Church in Essex, King Buxton. A king whose dynasty lasted generations, Simon Harrison's fierce little heavyweight is an often underappreciated member of the Robot Wars veteran class. The fifth longest appearing competitor in the show's history, King Buxton quietly collected 11 combat victories across its very long life. King Buxton first rose to prominence in a strong Series 2 campaign in which it reached the top 8 by dominating all talk and placing first in the semi-final gauntlet before losing to the reigning champion Roadblock. But it was the seemingly innocuous second round battle with Mike Franklin's Robodoc that would set the groundwork for King Buxton's real fame. Defeat in Series 3 at the hands of Robodoc's successor, 101, would set up Robot Wars' first real rivalry. Clashes between two silver boxes with minimal weapons may not seem like a source of entertainment to the masses, yet on Robot Wars, entire episodes could be dedicated to the novelty. Indeed, King B3 and 101 fought together as many times as they fought each other, and their triumph in the first tag team terror tournament was so fitting that the robot god struck down a usually reliable firestorm to ensure that it took place. From series 5 onwards, King Buxton's Powerworks and Remix models would struggle to keep up, plagued by internal problems and outgunned against huge flippers and axes, and yet would constantly surprise fans with their refusal to fall in the first round of the domestic championship. The Powerworks model earned its most famous victory in a battle it did not even win, being the only machine besides Razor to KO the seemingly unstoppable tornado in Extreme 1. Though Simon Harrison considered retiring over and over from the fourth wars onwards, there are few who would say the show is worse off for having a Series 2 robot throw its hat in the ring over and over and say, I'm still here, let's have some fun. Now King Buxton wheels and spins, trying to get back at RoboDoc. Avoiding each other, oh my goodness me! RoboDoc nearly went into the bit of oblivion and Matilda's gonna push him back there! Time is running out! RoboDoc heaves back at Matilda! Again he's turned up onto its head! Over the flaming pit! Charcoal RoboDoc! It goes to the judges, they think they've done enough! From cyberspace, Smidzy. Robot Wars fans tend to differ on the best robot never to win a heat in the UK, but almost all of them will list Smidzy as one of the candidates. The red and black demon box from Cyberspace is the only robot in history to make three heat finals and not win a single one of them, a testament to their consistency and determination. Smidzy, standing for sorry mate I didn't see you, is a common saying among motorbike riders and it was a team of such riders who met online and designed their robot. Ironically, Smidzy's easiest heat was its first heat and it was unable to overcome its only opponent, Rattus Rattus. However, performances against robots like Agrobot 2, Beast, Warhog and Mean Streak cemented Smidzy as a best of the rest robot, one who was well above the average competitor even though it rarely had the finishing power to take down an all-star. Eight of Smidzy's nine losses were to series semi-finalists, including spirited performances against Chaos 2 and Dominator 2 in series 5 and 6. Smidzy also made its Series 6 melee into one of the most entertaining fights in Robot Wars history, a rare achievement and something that most All-Stars were unable to do in that same series. Smidzy shows that keeping the same fundamentals can sometimes be a good luck charm, as the robot had amazing consistency and cements itself as a fan favourite. Smidzy has the lifter, trying, trying to force 99 kilos of machine out of the arena. It's on its side, it won't get down from there. Smidzy have won this. From Shropshire, Tulsa. The creation of Ellis Ware of Team Wranglebots, Pulsar's powerful vertical spinner had it pegged as one to watch going into Series 8. However, a round one loss to Y inside 3 and Chompalot almost saw Pulsar consigned to the dustbin of Robot Wars history. A second chance arose after Chompalot withdrew, or rather, exploded. And Pulsar took advantage of this opportunity, with a KO on Beast kickstarting its Series 8 campaign for real. After this, Pulsar defeated Ironside in controversial fashion, creating one of the few rivalries in the reboot in the process, before edging out Gabriel in the Heat Final to seal a place in the Grand Final. Perhaps controversially. Despite Pulsar's victories, these fights saw Pulsar suffer from consistent reliability issues. 
Those internal problems were ultimately too much in the grand final group battle as it fell to Thor and TR2. Pulsar would return for Series 9 even more powerful than before, as its fights against Supernova would show, with both thoughts virtually flinging each other over to the other side of the arena. But Pulsar's reliability issues continued to plague it, and by the end of the round robin stage, an exhausted Pulsar was reduced to cannibalizing its own stream mech just to enter the arena. Ultimately, a second grand final simply wasn't in its grasp, with rivals Ironside taking the day. Pulsar needed to evolve, in fact, hammered in by the rejection of its entry into Series 10, and so it was that Ellisware would tweak and evolve Pulsar into the beast that was Magnetar. Magnetar may have looked like nothing more than a fresh coat of paint and a new name slapped on an old bot, because in some ways it was, but it was a very different animal indeed under the hood. Even more powerful and much more reliable, in a series where most spinning weapons hummed or droned, Magnetar's drum roared. It breezed through its heat, winning most of its fights in a single devastating blow, effortlessly dispatching fellow Series 8 finalist Thor, and entered the grand final with a good chance of taking the whole thing. And I personally believe that it really could have done it. Sadly, it wasn't to be, with a faulty self-writing mechanism and some dodgy judging costing it the day in two heartbreakingly close fights. For all their issues, the Wranglebox series of machines proved themselves capable of dishing out some of the biggest hits the series ever saw and established themselves and their builder as one of the stars not only of the reboot, but of modern robot combat as a whole. Is the weaponry working now? On Thor! Magnetar's on top! You can hear the whir of the drum! Watch out, Thor! Oh, it's a blow! My goodness me! Full Gloves, Gabriel 2. Huge wheels, 25mm thick armour, a lengthy sword weapon. Gabriel sounds like a fearsome opponent on paper. And it is, but not in a way that is typical for Robot Wars. This wasn't a machine built for attack, attack, attack. This was a completely unique machine that brought about some completely unique battles as a result. Gabriel first entered in Series 8 and certainly divided opinions, with a set of people perplexed by the idea behind the machine, while a portion appreciated Gabriel's unique approach to robot combat. In the arena, Gabriel's contrasting design was most evident in the Heat Final as it faced Pulsar for a place in the Grand Final after wins over Chompalot and Beast. Here, both machines put in valiant displays and Gabriel proved that even against a precision milled high-tech machine like Pulsar, it could cause problems. Unfortunately, Gabriel wasn't awarded the subsequent judge's decision and it went on to miss out on a place in Series 9 too. Thankfully, its first campaign wasn't the only time we saw Gabriel, as it was grounded a place in Series 10. And if Gabriel had to prove itself all over again after a series away, it was certainly given the biggest possible task of achieving that, being dropped into a group battle with the devilish carbide. This was the breaking point for Gabriel, where it would either drown against a truly powerful spinner, or prove its durability could reach unthinkable levels. And Gabriel went on to prove that the unthinkable was possible. It may have lost the subsequent battle against Carbide, but Gabriel put the champion in unprecedented danger as it gladly ate up Carbide's attacks and spat them back at it. By the end of the fight, Gabriel was slashed and limping, but so was Carbide, and it must be stressed that the internal strain Gabriel caused on Carbide nearly forced Carbide to fill out of the competition for good. The rest of Gabriel's Series 10 campaign didn't quite match with what started it off, with defeats to Aftershock and Rabid M8 but Gabriel featuring in the World Series itself was proof that it had suddenly sealed its place in the big names of the reboot, which was remarkable to think about just months prior, and proves to everyone that even the most wacky designs can still be up there with the very best for reliability and vigour. Torn, battered, bruised, brilliant. They're still in there. <laughs> Who's gonna rush up the arena floor? Six, five, it's gonna go to the judges, is it? This is unbelievable! This is one of the greatest fights ever in Robot Wars history! Oh, Toby, that was... You did such a good job. Well done, mate. That was brilliant. That is a cool robot. From South Hockenden in Essex, Sir Cromelot. As a robot, Sir Cromelot was... Nothing too spectacular. Perfectly fine. Originally a hook cap on wheels with a spike on it, it gradually evolved into a hubcap on wheels with a flipper on it, and not too bad a flipper either, as its Series 6 victory over former semi-finalist GBH2 showed. Typically crashing out in the second round to much hardier opponents, normally a bot like Cromelot would struggle to make a list like this, never mind make the upper reaches, but Cromelot had something its opponents lacked. Class. Team Hubnuts, fronted most memorably by Steve Merrill and Ray Tate, was some of the greatest performers the show ever saw, 
bringing a flair and pizzazz to the arena that made them one of the most beloved teams in the show's history. The type of team to be more concerned with what jackets wear than trivialities like battle tactics or strategy. There was no war but the class war when the Hubnuts were about, and they truly never did anything by half. Whether bringing their own trooper cheerleaders or taking aim at the most deadly opponent of all, Jonathan Pierce, they brought a the kind of showmanship without which Robot Wars would feel a little bit empty. The arena's the stage and every bot's a player, and whenever Chrome took up its part, you knew you were in for a great time. Robot Wars, The Sixth Wars, Heat 4, License to Thrill. They call him Chromalot, Sir Chromalot. Hi, oh, good morning. Ah, oh, so you have my pit jacket. Excellent choice, thank you. Thanks very much. Right, I thought I'd have the purple on for the pips. What do you think? Uh, it's not looking too good, Steve. How would you um, like to try this? We'll go for the silver. Yeah, that does it. Excellent, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Looking forward to go to work. Robot Wars, Chromalot is here. The class act, as always, ready for action. We'll see you in the arena. From Northampton, Thor. Act spots and Robot Wars, Zoe seems to be all or nothing when it comes to memorability. Either they're one of the stars of the show, or they're Sergeant Peekle. Who? Yeah. I'm sure you get my point. But in the reboot series, it became harder and harder for an Xbox to make any kind of real showing. What with the massively improved armor standards in the last 12 or so years since the series has last been on air. So, what to do? Well, just have some old series robots come back and kick all kinds of robot butts. Case in point, 4. It didn't start out with the most graceful beginning ever. Being tossed against an eventual champion never really gives you that much of a chance to make a name for yourself after all. But Thor did start to groove out a small niche for itself in the New Blood Championship in Extreme 2, showing a lot of potential and finishing third. A memorable dream in Series 7 to do well enough to be seen as gave Thor an image of a robot that wanted to be feared, but could never truly achieve it. Well, not yet. Over the course of the TV show's hiatus, Thor started to show itself as one of the rare non-flippers that people properly feared, making it to numerous quarter and semi-finals of the UK and the World Championships alike. And then when the reboot run around, Thor positively stomped Heat B, winning all of its fights with ease, only to lose in a shocking loss to Shockwave in the Heat Final. Considered by many to be the only correct choice though, Thor was chosen to be the Grand Finals wild card, wearing it through carbines early on and well, it became a well-known zombie four, eventually reaching fourth place. While four would never reach his position again, always failing at the heat final, its presence in the heat was definitely a welcome one, and beating it meant that the robot was absolutely worth watching. And now, while four starts to get a terrifying second reign on the uh, life circuit in today's era, it seems that maybe every now and again, lightning does strike twice after all. There's the carnage! There's the wreckage! And boy, we love it! And off comes another piece! From Lillewallen in Holland, Gravity. By Series 7, Robot Wars had seen its fair share of flipper bots. Even the once special trick of throwing an opponent out of the arena was becoming more common. So a flipper bot debuting in Series 7 like the Dutch robot Gravity had a lot to prove. But Captain W.J. Dykstra knew his innovations in both size and system of pneumatics would give it throwing power that even the best bots in the UK would struggle to match. And if you're looking for a robot with an explosive debut, you can't do much better than Gravity. In their very first UK fight, they threw an opponent so hard that it broke the wall it landed on and not long after, tossed that robot clean out of the arena and broke a camera too. And that was just the first step in their romp to the top eight, where they made it look almost effortless as they shoved robots aside. Their pinnacle moment, and believe me, it was hard to choose one, had to be their match against Dan Tom Kia, where they broke the standing record for the shortest battle, stole it from Dan Tom Kia in fact, tossing it out in just 5.7 seconds. Ultimately, it was the reigning champ Tornado that felled gravity, using their precision control to beat its raw power, and their dreams of winning the world championship were cut short in the qualifiers by tough as nails. But the impression gravity left on the scene was overwhelmingly positive, 
It remains the only non-UK robot to reach the top 8, and it racked up three UDAs to its name, and it wasn't just competitors that had a reason to fear, the house robots weren't safe either. In the main competition, Gravity flipped two house robots, then flipped two more in the house robot rebellion, bringing its house robot scalp count to four, a record even Chaos 2 and Apollo can't claim. As the years have gone on, many robots have lost their allure, but this Flying Dutchman's esteem has only ever gone up, with no sign of ever coming down. Gravity's after Hydra though, you can tell, can't you? Has it against him in the sidewall? Oh, goodness me! Has destroyed the sidewall! Now what's gonna happen here? We're fighting on for the moment, they're out! They've gone! Hydra gone! But to me, the arena is unsafe, Cease should be called! Cease. And is! Thank goodness! From Dunnisthorpe, Swaddling Coat, Leicestershire, S3. How many of you guys can say that realistically you've seen a team go from having an uncompetitive machine to suddenly creating an absolute monster that pushed the boundaries for a certain weapon type? Well that's exactly what the One Law Associates did in their Robot Wars lifetime. This group of roboteers started out life with Sting, a very limited machine in terms of combat with a cute gimmicky weapon. It didn't do well in the two wars it was in, and when the One Law Associates missed the following series, you could understand if they've just packed in Robot Wars for good. Thank goodness they didn't. Returning in Series 5, the team entered S3, a robot with a long cylindrical body that was fronted with a brutal vertical spinner. Its debut victory against Plunderbird 5 was so impressive, and against the norm for this team, that Craig Charles thought they were newcomers. Experience was never a factor for this machine though, because its disc was truly an X factor as it ripped open Mousetrap, beat Grand Finalist Stinger, and perennial semi finalist Wild Thing and Spawn again on its route to that stage of the competition, sealing a mightily impressive debut campaign with five semi finalists defeated in six battles. By Series 5, good spinners were still almost an unknown, but S3's displays of power was enough to get it a lifetime pass to the club. S3's life on the show was ultimately short lived, with the team finally feeling burnt out by the end of Xtreme 2, hence why it doesn't even finish higher on this list, but the dominant victories against Plunderbird 5 and Shredder, the losers melee in Series 5, and its duel with Mousetrap were some of the best battles in the history of the show, and for that, we salute you, S3. The Plunderbird! Dicer! Lifter! Claw! Jaw! Looks so impotent! Rendered so! Because the pneumatic system has been ripped to shreds there by S3 and causing more damage to the armory of Blunderbird. The new boys are very, very dangerous. I know that they've been here before in Robot Wars with Sting, but this is a, a new machine in S3 and it looks absolutely awesome. On the attack again, oh! Slicing through Blunderbird by... Absolutely mashing it! From Edinburgh in Scotland, Typhoon 2. Just shy of the top 30, we finally have the first heavyweight champion on the list. Typhoon 2 entered Robot Wars off the back of repeated successes from the Typhoon machines in the lower weight classes, most notably its direct predecessor Typhoon, itself a three-time middleweight champion. Typhoon 2 scaled up the team's signature design to create a frightening full-body spinner, a weapon synonymous with Team Typhoon, and went far beyond the title of best full-body spinner in Robot Wars. As far as the classic series was concerned, Typhoon 2 was probably the single best spinner altogether. After a quiet debut in the Extreme 2 Annihilator, an appearance which exists only to put a single loss on Typhoon 2's record, the Edinburgh Air Cadets made their true mark in the Seventh Wars. In a series largely dominated by flipping weapons, Gary Cairns laughed in the face of adversity and entered the arena against four flippers in a row without even a self-writing mechanism on his machine and absolutely tore them apart. After an entire series of flippers, it was the spinner that came out on top in devastating fashion. Sure, their actual title fight against Storm 2 proved controversial enough to start arguments over who deserved to win the series even a decade after the battle took place, 
but this only helped to keep Typhoon 2 in the minds of fans throughout its 12 year reign as the incumbent Robot Wars champion. There's no doubt here that their path to the final was memorable, destructive and glorious. So what, then, keeps Typhoon 2 beneath its fellow champions in the list? It all has to come down to timing. Typhoon 2 essentially existed in a vacuum, competing in Series 7 and only Series 7, with no other campaigns good or bad to speak of. Not only is Typhoon 2 restricted to one series, but it was also reserved until the very end. In a series with 16 entire heats, we didn't even see Typhoon 2 until the 15th episode, and with viewership constantly declining on the unsupportive Channel 5, many simply didn't get to see Typhoon 2 in action. But for those who did, the only spinner to win a classic series stands as a true icon, and in my mind, a very worthy champion. Look at that speed for Typhoon 2 now! Listen! Listen! The Typhoon is nearing! It is closing! Momentarily, Atomic was in the eye of the storm and in the calm until Typhoon 2 came in. And again. Oh! From Alton in Hampshire, Blunderbird 5. Blunderbirds are go. Spanning the first five series of Robot Wars, these Thunderbirds inspired machines were no mere puppets, with five separate Blunderbirds competing year on year across the early stages of Robot Wars. Always one of the main fixtures of their heats, the Plunderbird machines certainly made their mark, although it was often the international wrecking crew and their robots who needed rescuing. With early exits in series 1, 3, 4 and 5, the Plunderbird machines were hardly renowned for their quality in combat, but that was never really the point with these bots. The plunder machines were not truly remembered for the robots themselves, which were largely just wedges with the occasional saw or grippy weapon. Rather, the Plunderbird reaching number 31 on our list thanks to its very memorable team. Often known as the Plunderbird Boys, Team Captain Mike Onslow and mainstay Brian Kilburn were there to bring the hard man act to Robot Wars, and continued to go above and beyond, always in the same camo pants and black sunglasses. With their repeated gags, rhymes and insults to other teams, always with the same bad attitude, the Plunderbird boys made sure that every single interview they found themselves in was a delight, usually providing much more entertainment than the surrounding fights ever could. From even their earliest appearances, the Plunderbird boys brought their own theme song for a performance inside the arena, and it only got bigger and bolder, arriving at Series 4 in a military Chinook before using Robot Wars Extreme to challenge the Roboteers to a rap battle, and hijack the show's end credits for a sing-song. Plunderbird could generally roll out into the arena and be dead from the outset, and it would still be remembered fondly in the taste of good humour. That really happened, by the way. The third Plunderbird machine didn't even move, and it was still a great series highlight. Surprisingly, the team did actually find some success in the second wars, with their stoic pusher Plunderbird 2 winning its heat to making a respectable exit in the series semi-finals. But no matter how the robots performed, the Plunderbird boys proved that you can be remembered and loved on Robot Wars, not just for the robots, but for the people behind the machines too. The forecast bad, you better keep running, it's gonna be tough cause there's a Plunderstorm coming! Next year. Well, Chrome a lot won, which means that a fish are the best showman on Robot Wars, and Plunderbird can't sink. But there's one thing I'm not, and that's big and bad and mean. So Plunderbird can sing us out of Robot Wars. Extreme, take it away, boys. Of course we have! 